Um, okay, okay, I'm ready to begin. Um, so hello everyone, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I am Matthew, and I'm going to be telling you four stories about recreational maths. So this is kind of like four talks I've given at shorter events, kind of crammed together into one longer talk, um, to keep you entertained for a full half an hour. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Um, so I am a PhD student at UCL. Um, some of you might have seen me last time when I was just starting my PhD, I'm now two years in. Um, and I work on, on um, numeric analysis, so I work with um, PDEs. Um, so if you are interested in um, acoustics or electromagnetics, talk to me afterwards. I work on this bit of software called Ben++, um, which is really nice. We can do really cool 3D simulations, but in reality, I spend most of my time doing things like this, where I, oh, ah, where I have simulated the, an electromagnetic wave bouncing off the EMF camp logo, um, because I didn't feel like working that day. Um, but anyway, on to, the, on to the point of today's talk. So the first story I'm going to tell you is about menace. Um, so recently, um, machine learning has been in the news an awful lot with um, machines finally beating Go. Um, and it's a big talking point. But a lot of the time, you don't really get told how machine learning actually works. So I'm going to explain to you one very simple aspect of machine learning and tell you how to actually teach a, a computer to learn something. Um, and I'm going to talk it, tell, explain it by explaining the machine built in the 1960s um, by this man, Donald Mitchie. Um, so before the 60s, he'd worked with Alan Turing at Bletchley Park during the war, where we were two years ago. Um, but then after, the, after that, in the 60s, he became interested in biology and machines and learning, and he built a machine called Menace. So this is a photo of his machine, Menace. Um, there are 304 matchboxes, um, which he has meticulously drawn a noughts and crosses arrangement on each one, um, stuck little bits of carbon in each one, and filled each one with little tokens. Um, and I should say, MENACE stands for Machine Educable Noughts and Crosses Engine. Brilliant acronym. Um, and this is his machine, which he, he, he designed, in, and it can learn to play noughts and crosses. Um, so how it works, I'm going to explain with an example game. Um, so the MENACE is going to play as noughts, and we're going to play as crosses. Um, so to start off, we find the box which has this position drawn on it. So as I said, each box has a position drawn on it, and we find the box which has no counts on it. We shake this box, we open the box, and we find a red token at the front. Um, and a red token is code for going here. So Menace has made its move. Um, now it's my move, and I decide to go here. Um, then again, it's Menace's move. So then we find the box which has this design drawn on it, so it would be that box. Um, we shake that box, we open the box, and we found a blue token, and a blue token is code for going here. Um, now it's my turn again, I go here. I'm at this point quite happy with myself, I seem to be doing quite well. Um, it's Menace's turn, so I find the box again with that on it, shake the box, open the box, and a green token. The green token is code for going here. So it's blocked me. Um, okay, my move. I'm now very, very happy with myself. Um, but again, it's Menace's turn, I find that box, shake the box, open it, find a yellow token, and yellow is code for going there, and I go there, and I've won. Um, so this, this is a game which is early on before it's done much learning. It's not very good, and I've just destroyed it. But here is where the learning happens, and this is how the machine learning works. I take that token out of the box, which means this was probably a bad move because it led to losing. It's now less likely to do that. I take that token away, it's less likely to go there. I take these tokens away, and it's less likely to make the mistakes it made again. And if you play about 50 games against this, it gets pretty good at drawing with you, um, just by that sim those simple mechanics. You should also, um, as well as losing, if you draw, you add one bead, and if you win, you add three beads. So you're kind of encouraging it to do more of the things that led to winning, discouraging it to do things that led from losing. Um, and this um, matchbox machine it actually does particularly well. So this is the graph of um, Donald's tournament with it. So he spent a whole weekend playing 240 games against this thing, carefully adding and taking away tokens, um, and plotting out what happened. So this is, um, starting at zero here, it is the change in the number of tokens he's got. So you can see it started off by losing lots of games, so the amount of tokens decreased, and then it got pretty good at learning here and increased, and then each of these is where he changed his strategy. Um, so you can see here, he changed to a new strategy, which I hadn't seen before, so it doesn't know how to win yet. But after about 20 games, it picks up, it's worked out how to beat him on that strategy, and it carries on like that. Um, so this is how to teach 304 matchboxes how to play noughts and crosses. Um, and if you want to play against it, you can go to this page on my website where I've built a JavaScript version of it um, to save you the time of building one yourself, 
Alternatively, um, you could go away and build your own copy of it, which is what Oliver just here did when I did this talk at CCC. Um, he got his matchboxes, printed all of these, which all have the positions in them, filled it all up, um, laser cut a brilliant box for it. Um, but if you have any ideas what to do with them, I'm sure he'd like to hear from you because... Did you find anything to do with them? Oh, nice. So he's, he's approximated pi by dropping them on parallel lines um, because a large number of straight sticks will do that for you. Brilliant. Um, right, on to story number two. Um, this is about a Twitter bot I created about two years ago called Maths Logic Bot, um, which looks a little bit like this. Um, so it says, I tweet logical tautologies. I'm currently working my way through propositional calculus. You can read how our book here. Um, and so it does these brilliant, really interesting tweets like this. Um, so I'm going to explain to you what it me I mean by logical tautologies and propositional calculus and what this bot is actually doing. Um, so this is um, part of, is, this is kind of, it, propositional calculus, it's a form of um, formal logic in maths. So it's a way of writing sentences and then analyzing these and analyzing the system of logic itself rather than just using logic to prove things. Um, and so you build up these sentences in it from certain symbols. And these are the symbols we are allowed to use. So we're allowed to use variables. So I'm going to lose the letters A to Z and then carry on with Greek letters if I need any more um, as variables. So they can be things which are set to be either true or false. I'm going to use not. So this symbol like that means not. This symbol means implies. This symbol means if and only if, or which is kind of like is equal to. This is and, and this is or, and I'm going to use brackets. And these are the only symbols I'm allowed to use in this story. Um, and they're helpful down the side of the slide if you need to look up what they mean. Um, and from these symbols, we're allowed to, call, we're allowed to build what, we're, what are called formulae. And these are kind of strings of symbols that make sense together. So obviously, you can't have like three open brackets, because that is nonsense. It doesn't work. So we have rules. We're allowed to build formulae. And there's three rules. Um, the first rule is that every variable is a formula. The second rule is that if I've got a formula, then doing not that formula, that's still a formula. And if I've got two formulae, then I can put any of these between them and wrap them in brackets. Um, so for example, A is a formula because of rule one. Um, a implies A is a formula because of rule three, because I've taken two copies of that one and put an arrow between them. Um, that is a formula by, B is a formula by the top one. This is a formula, then putting them together by the third rule, you get that. And Lots of ugly things like that are formulas. You can kind of combine these symbols, and it doesn't really matter what they mean, but they make sense, because if you read them out as using these, you have like A implies A. You have B if and only if A implies A. So these are things that can make sense, and you can work out um, kind of the, the truth of the sentence. Um, so what the bot is doing is it's tweeting the tautologies, and tautologies are formulae that are true whatever the values of the variables. Um, for example, A or not A. Um, because if A is true, then that says true or not true. So then true or not true is like true or false. And like one of true and false is true. And if A is false, it says false or not false. So it's like false or true. Um, so it makes sense. It's kind of a bit like to be or not to be. One of them has to be true. Um, similarly, A if and only if A is true, because if and only if is very similar to the equal sign. So it's something like, well, of course A is equal to A. That's a tautology. However, A and B is not a tautology because if A and B are both false, then that's obviously not going to come out true. Um, so that is not a tautology. So we're just interested in the sentences in this language that are true whatever we do with these variables. Um, OK, so I decided um, to try and make a Twitter bot that tweets all of these that are less than 140 characters long. Um, so very briefly how this works. Um, is I started by running through all possible strings of symbols. Um, so forgetting about formulae for now, um, just running through them like this. So I did all the strings which are one character long, then start with one of the ones two characters long, and so on and so on and so on. And then for each of these, um, I first check that it's actually a formula. Um, so at this point, I can get rid of almost everything on the board, because one and two character long things are almost certainly not formulae. So once I've got that, so I'm running through all the formulae and checking they're valid, and then I try all the different truth assignments. So for the first one, if A, I try if A is false, is it, is it false? If A is true, is it true? And if it is always true, I tweet it. And you get lovely tweets like this. So this is one that Tautology did back in April. 
um, which I'm not going to attempt to read out now, but you can believe me that that is always going to be true, whatever the values of A and B. Um, and maybe you can sit on Netflix and work out why. Um, brilliantly, for a while, Twitter had this um, automatic translate function here. Um, so if you clicked on that, um, brilliantly, it realized it was in Hungarian, was what I, and what I was actually trying to say was the arrow A and, and all that garbage, which was very helpful of Twitter. Um, they've got rid of that feature now um, for um, no apparent reason. Um, okay, so the first 18 tautologies are these. And so there's a few I've been through there. They seem pretty reasonable. The first one's like A is the same as A. If A is true, then A is true. Either A or not A are true, or A or not A are true, and then some more. And at this point, I began to wonder um, how many tautologies there were going to be of each length. So you can see that there's two that have five characters. There's two that have six characters. Um, there's quite a lot more that have seven characters. There's more that have this many characters. Um, and I started wondering what the sequence of the number of tautologies would look like. Um, so I added it to the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, which if you haven't heard of it, it's a really, really great online tool. Um, if you're ever trying to solve some problems, like um, during my PhD, it comes up a lot, you get some numbers coming out, you type them in there, and you can almost certainly find out what the sequence is and loads of links to facts about it. Um, so this sequence, I, was, I started one, trying to think about some properties this sequence might have. Um, and I realized a few things. Um, firstly, if you've got a tautology, then not not that tautology is also a tautology. It's like if something's true, then not not that thing must also be true, because the nots kind of cancel each other out. Which means the number of tautologies of length n plus 2 is going to be bigger than the number of tautologies of length n. Because for every tautology of length n, we can make another one with two knots in front. So there's got to be more of them that are two strings symbols longer. Similarly, you can get lots of situations like this where you've got a tautology and you say something doesn't matter or this thing which we know is always true. Um, so you get that the number of tautologies of length n plus 4 has also got to be bigger than the number of tautologies of length n. Um, so it looks like as we get these, these strings longer and longer, we're going to be getting more and more tautologies. Um, so I made the conjecture that it's going to be increasing. So whenever we have a, another character, we're going to get more tautologies. Um, but it turns out it's completely not true because the next one is 6. So already it decreases. Um, but carrying on from there, we get 57, 88, 373, 554, 2086, and so on. And so it looks like maybe that six is just a weird blip because our, num our number of symbols is quite short, and maybe it does increase forever. Um, so my modified conjecture is for n bigger than eight, um, it's going to be increasing. But I have no idea if this is true or not. Um, and no real idea how to prove this. So if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to talk to you afterwards about how we might go about seeing if this is true or not. Um, brilliant. OK, my third story, I'm doing great for time, is about optimal Pac-Man. Um, so this is an idea I actually had at the last EMF camp when I was in the arcade tent. I was playing Pac-Man, and I got to wondering um, which route I should actually take on Pac-Man. Because it's not obvious what's, where's the best direction to go at all points. Um, and this is when I got down to sitting down a few weeks afterwards and working out what I should do in Pac-Man, so I was ready to come here and be better at Pac-Man. Um, it reminded me of some pro a few problems, and there's some bits of maths I used. So the first problem it reminded me of is, oh, I should say Pac-Man. You all know what Pac-Man is. That side can be skipped. Um, so this is the map you've got here, and, and find the route in this is the difficult question I was thinking about. And it reminded me of this problem, the Seven Bridges of Königsberg problem. So this is a problem from the 1700s, which was solved by this man, um, Leonard Euler, um, and led to the whole creation of the field of graph theory. Um, and this is a map of Königsberg, which is not very well drawn because I drew it myself, where you had this town with four islands and these seven bridges going between the islands. And the townsfolk of Königsberg used to play a really fun game how, where they'd walk around these islands and try and cross each bridge once and exactly once. So for example, you'd go over there and keep going around this way and you're stuck, and you've missed a bridge. Um, so they wanted to find a route to go over every bridge to see lots of the town, but they didn't want to go back on themselves because that's really boring. Um, and they found this really, really hard to do, um, but kept trying anyway, um, until Leonard Euler came along, and he worked out why they'd been finding it so hard, um, because in fact it was impossible. And he explained why this was impossible. And he did this first by simplifying the map you've got down to what he called a graph, um, like this. So 
These are exactly the same diagrams, but here I've, just kind of, I've shrunk each time down to a dot. I just put lines in, because we really we don't care what the map looks like. We just care how the bridges connect the islands. And this is what mathematicians confusingly call a graph, um, and not like the x and y coordinates things. We call these graphs. Um, and then he had uh, the, the real important thing he noticed here was that, so we're trying to look for a route which goes up all these bridges once. But to find that route, if you think about walking around this island, um, if I'm walking down here and I arrive at this island, I need to leave this island again. And I need to leave this island again. So every time I come into one of these islands, I'm going to have to leave again. Which means it's only possible to do this route if I can pair at the edges at each vertex. So here we're going to have a problem, because if we come in on one and go out of another, we've got this one, one out, which eventually, if we come in on here, we're stuck. Um, so it turns out the, the important thing about this problem that he solved is that if you've got any edges with an odd number of bridges, sorry, any islands with an odd number of bridges, it's going to be impossible. And so this is impossible because you've got three islands there, so three bridges there, three bridges there, three bridges there, and five bridges there. Um, so every island you're going to get stuck at, so it's impossible to find one of these routes. Um, okay, so cool, we've done this with a 300-year-old problem. How about Pac-Man? Um, so if you take Pac-Man and make it into a graph, um, you get this graph here. So I've just taken um, each of the points where multiple routes meet, such as here and here. I've made it into one of these points. And I've replaced all of the curvy edges with lines. Because I don't care about distances and how it's arranged. I just care about how things are connected. And each of the nodes in red have an odd number of edges. Um, so we have a lot of odd number of edges. Uh, a lo a lo we have a lot of edges. We have a lot of islands that have an odd number of edges, um, so we definitely can't do this without looping back on ourselves. Um, so it's impossible to complete Pac-Man without looping back on yourself, um, which is not surprising, because if any of you have played Pac-Man, you will know it's impossible to complete Pac-Man without looping back on yourself, because it's, you can't do it. it. It's really hard to do, because it's impossible. Um, so I've not actually solved the problem yet, though. Um, so I've used this 300-year-old thing, and found that it's impossible. So we want to do something better now and work out how should I be doing Pac-Man, given that I've got to do some repeating. Um, so this is a different problem related to the first one called the Chinese postman problem. Um, where, so the Chinese postman problem is you've got a postman who needs to go down all of the roads to deliver letters, and he wants to do that by walking the shortest distance possible. So it's a slight extension from the last one. Like, instead of just like, not going back on yourself, it's if you have to go back on yourself, What's the least amount of going back on yourself that you have to do? And the way you can go about solving this is that um, going back on yourself is a bit like building a copy of the bridge right next to the first bridge. So for example, on Königsberg, you could imagine two extra bridges there, which are really just repetitions of this bridge and this bridge. And now, by adding these lines, everything has an even number of edges. Um, and so I could do a route around this. Or I could have added these edges here and again, made everything even. Or I could have had those three edges there and made everything even. Um, and we're interested in the shortest way of doing this. So looking at these three options, if we add up the total length of those two bridges, add up the length of those two bridges, and add up the length of those three bridges, whichever of those add up to the least, that's going to be the shortest way of doing this path um, going over all the different bridges. Um, so we need to look at all the combinations of matching up these odd edges. Um, for Pac-Man, um, it turns out this is the shortest pairings for Pac-Man. Um, and with this number of edges, it took my computer all night to solve this, because um, as you add edges, the number of possible ways of pairing them up increases really, really quickly. So if Pac -Man, the Pac-Man map was much bigger, um, this would be almost impossible to solve, because it gets out of hand really, really fast. Um, but luckily for Pac-Man, we managed to do this. Um, so these are the edges I want to repeat. Um, so I got very good at Pac-Man the day after I worked this out, and there should be some sound coming on now. Um, this is my attempt to win at Pac-Man. Oh, it's, it's eerily quiet. So I've repeated that edge, then I go around here. And I've repeated that edge. No, I haven't. I've gone over that once. OK, I've repeated that one edge there. And I'm going up the top. So there's that edge repeated. And that edge repeated. 
and that one, and that one, another one repeated, so I need to repeat that one down there next, this goes there, and then finally go back and fill in the one I hadn't repeated over there, and that is the quickest possible way to complete Pac-Man. And of course, then it starts all over again. I couldn't be bothered to do it more than once in a row, so I stopped the video there. Um, OK, so my final story, which is actually more of a puzzle than a story. Um, so I thought it would be fun to send you away with something to go and think about and something to do. Um, so this is a, a few puzzles I've been thinking about recently that I've been working on. I've got a few ideas of how to solve some of them and not others. So this is something to keep you entertained this evening um, when you get bored of going to all the workshops, which will never happen because there's so much to do here. Um, um, so this is a puzzle, first of all, taken from Starting Points by Banwell's Swords and Tartar, which is a really good teaching book full of um, kind of investigatory maths. And the question in this book is, um, you take a rectangle like this 4x3 rectangle here, and you fire a ball across at 45 degrees, um, so that it goes down here, carries on, bounces off the side, and carries on. And eventually, it ends up in the top right corner. So for a 4x3 rectangle, the bouncing ball ends up at the top right corner. Um, so the puzzle is, for different sized rectangles, what corner will the line end up in? Um, and I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to leave you with that to go away and think about, because it's really fun to work out. Um, but it's not that difficult. This, you can work this out um, in about 20 minutes. You can get a good answer and work out why, why that would be. Um, but from this, there's a few related puzzles I got wondering about. Um, so the first thing I thought was, um, how many squares does the line go through on its way? So in the 4 by 3 rectangle, there's a diagonal line going through every single one of the smaller squares. But for different sizes, for example, we've got a 3 by 6 here. Um, we only go through those squares. So when will the line go through all the squares is another question. And this is one I haven't actually worked out the answer to yet. Um, so I'm probably going to work this out myself this evening if I can. Um, and a third question is, how many corners does it go through? So as the line's going round, um, on the 4 by 3 rectangle, it goes through those corners. Um, but if you take a general rectangle, how could you count the number of corners it goes through? Um, which is another problem to pose. I have solved this one. I was very happy with the way I worked this one out. Um, and when will it go through the, all the corners? And this is related to there's this problem called the cross diagonal cover problem by Garish Corporal, which he blogged about here. Um, so he was in a maths lecture, um, got a bit bored, and started doodling on rectangles. Um, so he got his rectangle, and he started drawing crosses going in a diagonal way. So fairly similar to what I was doing. He did some crosses going like this and bouncing around the rectangle like that and eventually reach another corner. So kind of similar to what I was doing, but a little bit different. And then he asked the question, um, how many of the squares end up with crosses inside them? Um, and I was very happy when I found this on the internet, because it turns out this is exactly the same as that rectangle here. So this rectangle here is one square larger than that one. But if you connect up the middle points of that, then the pattern I just drew across is, is exactly the same as the pattern I have on my rectangle up there. So his problem is kind of a way of looking at my problem upside down. Um, so by having solved that, I managed to solve his problem. Um, so that is three fun puzzles for you to go and work on this evening. And let me know if you find some answers, because it would be good to confirm I'm right and find out answers for the ones I haven't yet solved. Um, but for now, this is a clue. Um, so when I said I was bouncing around the rectangle, you could instead imagine that you've actually got mirrors here, and the ball is going straight down. That will really help. That immediately solves two of the problems. So that is a clue for anyone who wants to go and work, work on this. Um, but for now, that is all I'm going to talk to you for now. So I'll, I'll go to the bar now, and you can come and chat with me and ask some questions. Thank you for listening.